And if you have your Bibles today, I want to encourage you to turn to Judges chapter 13. You can either get them out or turn them on, however you're using the Word of God today. And if you're using a a tablet or a smartphone, make sure you look at the bottom of the bulletin or the bottom of the front of the bulletin, and you're going to find a short link to some digital notes that will be a help to you. But also in your bulletin, you're going to find some, I, I guess we would call them hard copy notes, and that can be a help to you if you are following along in a I guess you'd call it a written copy, a book copy of God's Word. It's uh, uh, the terminology that we're getting into in the digital age is such an interesting thing. Judges chapter 13, we're going to look at one verse at the beginning, and then we're going to follow and track a story through the course of three chapters. We're looking at the last major judge in the book of Judges, a man by the name of Samson. And here's what the Bible says. It talks about a mother, and it says in verse 24, So the woman gave birth to a son and named him Samson. The boy grew, and the Lord blessed him. That's a great verse of Scripture. And if we were to take that verse and isolate it from the rest of what we know and what we will see today, what a great legacy that would be. But that's not exactly how it ends. Let's go ahead and bow and have a word of prayer, and then we'll get into this text. Father, I do pray that during this time you'd give us understanding so that we can have hope. Lord, we look at a nation in crisis. We look at a nation in turmoil today. And I pray that you would help us to be able to see not just who our leaders need to be, but who we need to be to impact this nation for the cause of Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. So she held in her arms a baby for which she had prayed. Samson's mother could not have children until an angel of the Lord came to her and told her she would have a child. It was a baby that God had promised. They were so excited about this child, and they gave him a special name. She named him Samson. You know what the name Samson means? It means sunshine. Sunshine. Maybe she called him Sonny when he was little. I don't know. Maybe she held him in her arms and rocked him and sang to him. Maybe she sang the, whatever the Hebrew counterpart to You Are My Sunshine is. I don't know. But what a blessing this boy had been to her, and what an amazing heritage he had. Two people who could not have children, and the angel of the Lord comes to them and tells them that she's going to have this child. As a matter of fact, he also said he was going to be a Nazarite. Now, what is a Nazarite? Look at verse 5. It says, For indeed you will conceive and give birth to a son. You must never cut his hair, because the boy will be a Nazarite to God from birth. And he will begin to save Israel from the power of the Philistines. What does it mean to be a Nazarite? The word Nazarite means, at its root, different or separated. This child was to be set aside for God, and as a sign that he was going to be set aside for God, an outward display of that, he was not to drink wine or anything intoxicating, anything that had any alcohol. Number two, he wasn't to touch any dead thing. Number three, he was to let his hair grow. So in other words, he could never get a haircut because that was a sign that he was going to be different. He was going to be set aside. He was a man who was anointed by God and a man who had tremendous strength. When I say the word Samson, when I say the name Samson, I'm sure most of you, if you know anything about Scripture, and it's okay if you don't because we're going to be looking at it today, but if you know anything about Scripture, when you hear the word Samson, you think of somebody with tremendous strength. One day, this guy slew, killed 1,000 Philistines. 1,000. And he did it with a whited bone that he found in the field, just picked it up and started killing him. One time he took the entire city gates of Gaza, the posts and the gates and all, and put them on his back, carried them up a hill, and left them there. 
On another occasion, a lion roared against young Samson, and the Bible says he took that lion and he killed that lion the same way he would have killed a young goat. This man was strong. Now, what was the secret of his strength? I mean, when you think of Samson, what do you think of? The Incredible Hulk? Maybe? You know, it's interesting because in most depictions that we see of Samson, you see somebody who looks like the Incredible Hulk or looks like Arnold Schwarzenegger in his heyday or something like that, just all these rippling muscles all over him. I don't think he was that way. I mean, had you seen Samson, I don't think you would have known that he was strong just by looking at him. He didn't have mountains of muscles, bulging biceps. Well, you say, Pastor, how do you know that? Well, why did Delilah keep asking him, what's the source of your strength? What's the secret of your strength? What is it that makes you so strong? She asked him four different times in four different ways. Why did she keep asking him that? If he had all these bulging muscles, it would have been apparent what the source of his strength was. No, there was something supernatural about his strength, and it was not in his build. It was the power of God. The Bible says the Holy Spirit of God would come and would rest upon him. Do not ever make the mistake, by the way, that his strength was in his hair either. His hair was only a symbol of his strength, his separation before God. The Spirit of God came and rested on his life and gave him that physical strength, and that is an illustration to all of us who need spiritual strength every day of our lives, that the power of the Holy Spirit is there for us as well. But not only was he spiritually strong, not only was he physically strong, Samson was also mentally strong. When you read these three chapters about the life of Samson, one of the things you're going to see, Samson had a very sharp mind. He had a very quick wit. He loved a joke. He loved to turn a phrase. He had a way with words. You're going to see that several different times today. He had a keen sense of humor. And I'll bet you he was a nice guy to have around. I'll bet you he was the kind of guy you'd like to have at a party. He was the kind of guy who could engage a lot of people in conversation, and people like to be around him. Everybody knows somebody who brightens up a room by leaving it, don't you? Uh, that wasn't Samson. Samson was the guy you wanted to have around. He was sunshine. But here's the sad thing. As we read this story, it's not going to be a happy story. It's actually a tragedy. It is the story of a man who went from the zenith of being a hero to essentially being a zero. Somebody who went from being a victor to being a victim. We're going to see disobedience. We're going to see disgrace and destruction. Samson is a bundle of contradictions if you're studying the word of God. He was bold before men and the enemy, but he was totally weak before women. The spirit of God was on his life, but yet he continued to give away to the lusts of the flesh and just to run around after that. He was called upon to declare war against the people of God and those, or against the enemies of the people of God, and those were the very people that he wanted to go around and consort with all the time. He fought the Lord's battles every day, and he broke the Lord's commandments every night. His name speaks of light, but ultimately he ended up in darkness. We'll talk about that. That reminds me of something I've said before. In your chair, everybody where you're sitting in this place today, there are three people sitting in that chair this morning. The person you are now, the person you could be for God if you will yield yourself to him, and the person that you could be if you take your eyes off of God. Three different people sitting in that same chair right now. The Bible says, Whoever thinks he stands must take heed not to fall. That brings something very interesting because Samson was a man of God. I believe one day I will see Samson in heaven. In heaven. Hebrews 11, verse 32. He's one of the heroes of the faith. Uh, the writer of Hebrews says, The time would fail me. The time does not allow for me to tell of Gideon and of Barak and of Samson. 
and of Jephthah. So he's listed in the hall of fame of faith. I will get to heaven one day and I will see Samson there. Once somebody is a child of God, that means they are forever a child of God. I'm not talking about somebody who's just a church member, somebody who's been baptized, somebody who repeated a phrase after somebody and doesn't even know what that was. I'm talking about somebody who has been born twice, somebody who is possessed with the power of the Spirit of God. I'm talking today about somebody who's genuinely been born again. That person can never, ever again be a lost soul. I believe that. But that does not mean, and you're going to see that in Samson's life, that does not mean you can live however you want. It makes a difference how you live. Samson paid for his sin, and he paid very dearly in seven different installments. We're going to see him today. First thing I want you to see, he dishonored his parents. He dishonored his parents. Verse 1 says, Samson went down to Timnah and saw a young Philistine woman there. Now remember, the Philistines were the pagans, the ungodly, those people who didn't know God, the idol worshipers. The word Philistine literally translated means sea peoples. They were people who lived on the eastern side of the Mediterranean Sea, and they would go out and they would fish in the Mediterranean Sea. They even worshipped a god named Dagon that was half man and half fish. You would worship Dagon by going up to a big statue of Dagon that overlooked the Mediterranean Sea, taking your firstborn child, think about your firstborn child when they were a baby, and throwing them into the Mediterranean Sea. That was how you worship Dagon. Incredible wickedness in the lives of these people. And that's why God was going to raise up Samson to deliver the nation of Israel from the power of the Philistines. It says Samson went down to Timnah and saw a young Philistine woman there. He went back and told his father and mother, I've seen a young Philistine woman in Timnah. Now get her for me as a wife. Are you serious? These are the enemies of God. These aren't the people he's supposed to be marrying into. Verse 3, but his father and mother said to him, can't you find a young woman among your relatives or among any of our people? <laughs> among any of our people. Must you go to the uncircumcised Philistines for a wife? But Samson told his father, get her for me because I want her. Here's the first step in his downward journey. Now remember, this man had godly parents, and I want to make sure I preface everything I am beginning to say to you by this. Samson had parents who loved God, who were seeking the best for his life. They were seeking spiritually the highest for him. Maybe you had parents growing up who were not like that, okay? But these parents were serving God, actively involved in seeking the best for their son, Samson. His parents had prayed for him. His parents were filled with the wisdom of God. But Samson one day wandered away from home. He got in the wrong company. He met a girl who did not know the Lord. Now she was beautiful. He saw her, and what he saw pleased him. By the way, let me take a rabbit trail right here, parents. Teach your children that the way somebody looks is not the primary determiner of a relationship. Teach them that foundationally that person needs to know God oh she was beautiful outside anyway he fell in love with her and he wanted to marry her his parents said Samson don't do this now why didn't they want him to marry this Philistine girl maybe you're saying hey you know what this is a real Romeo and Juliet kind of thing I read about this in English same reason the Apostle Paul said in 2 Corinthians 6 verse 14 and I want every unmarried boy and girl and student in this room to make sure you listen to this do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers the Bible commands let me reiterate that the Bible commands that if you are a child of God you are not listen to me you are not to marry an unsaved person if you do you are headed for trouble you're going to have problems with your mate. You're going to have the problem of spiritual disagreement. Amos 3 verse 3 says, Can two walk together unless they be agreed? 
That's a good question. How could you, a child of God, marry an unsaved person? What disagreements you're going to have? You're going to want to worship on Sunday. The pagan you're married to is going to want to sleep in. You're going to want to give to the work of God. The unbeliever you're married to is going to say, oh, we can't afford to do that. You're going to want to make Sunday a holy day. And that person you're married to says, but I have a bunch of things I want to do. You're going to want to pray for your family when you come to a time of crisis. And that person may very well even ridicule or at best just ignore your desire to go to the throne of God. You're going to want to raise your children for God and teach them the things of God. And that person's going to say, that's no big deal. They're going to work against it. By the way, did you know it's hard to get to church on Sunday morning? Say amen if you think it's hard to get to church on Sunday morning. Amen. Yeah. It is harder to get to church on Sunday morning than it is to get to work on Monday morning. Why is that? Number one reason, because the devil fights against it. The devil doesn't fight against you going to work on Monday morning, but he fights against you coming to church on Sunday morning. Folks, we get here early. Our family gets here early every Sunday morning. Why? Because we start on Saturday night. I'm serious. It's difficult. It's hard. It is hard for us, and I love God, and Kara loves God, and it's still hard for us to get everything together with the devil fighting against you and get here. What would it be like if I were a pagan or if she was a pagan? One of us was wanting to go and the other one wasn't. I'm telling you, there's going to be spiritual disagreement and spiritual division if that happens. The Bible says this. I love what the Bible says in Ecclesiastes. Solomon says, a threefold cord is not easily broken. A threefold cord. In marriage, that's a pretty easy cord because there's a husband and there's a wife. That makes two cords. And then if they know Jesus as Savior, there's the Holy Spirit of God who is that third cord. We are one in the bond of love. A threefold cord is not easily broken. Those who do not know Jesus as Savior, if you marry somebody who does know Jesus as Savior, you have a greater opportunity, and statistically, there is a greater likelihood of divorce. Divorce between people of differing faith, where somebody is involved in the things of God and the other person is not involved in the things of God, it is three times more likely that you will be divorced than if both people love God, or even if both people do not. Have you ever thought about what it means to a child when mom loves God and dad doesn't? Or dad loves God and wants to serve him and mom doesn't? They're confused. Sometimes those kids grow up confused the entire time in childhood, wondering what their spiritual role is. And here was Samson. Fell in love with an unbeliever. His parents warned him. They might as well have been talking to a wall. Samson ought to have known the word of God. Exodus 20, verse 12 says, Honor your father and mother. Here's why. That your days may be long in the land which the Lord your God gives you. Folks, I want you to mark it down plain and straight. Samson died young. And he died young in part, not exclusively, but in part, because he wouldn't listen to his godly parents. He died when he should have been at the zenith of his career. And one reason why was because he failed to honor his father and his mother. He dishonored his parents. Second thing, though, he deserted his promise. He deserted his promise. Chapter 14, flip the page there. Look at verse 5. It says, Samson went down to Timnah with his father and mother and came to the vineyards of Timnah. Suddenly, a young lion came roaring at him. Let me ask you a real simple question. Somebody who has a Nazarite vow, and it is against the vow for them to drink any alcoholic or non-alcoholic fruit of the vine, what on earth is he doing in a vineyard? Good question. He's not even supposed to touch it. Yet there he is. He's in a vineyard. 
He's got no business there. He's taken a little bypass. Oh, you know, it's just a little thing. It's just a small thing. Folks, sin always starts off small. It's always starting off as a little thing. Nobody goes roaring into sin. It starts off little. Here's Samson. He's flirting, just flirting around with a little bit of sin. He's playing with sin. And there in the vineyard, there's a lion, and he winds up killing that lion that we talked about. The lion attacks him, and he kills it. And then he goes down to Philistia. He goes down there to a wedding party. He begins to have fun with this girl's relatives, with her brothers, her brother's friends. See Samson down there. He's laughing and joking. He's gambling, the Bible says, fighting. You feel like saying, Samson, wake up. Come on, man. What are you doing? Your job, what you were born for, is to go out and to deliver the children of Israel from bondage. God has blessed you. What are you doing? Why don't you stop? But he's deserting his promise. What was his promise? To deliver Israel. But now rather than delivering Israel, he's consorting with the very enemy he's supposed to be delivering them from. He deserts his promise. Third, he distorted his purpose. He distorted his purpose. He goes down there to Timnah. They're having a wedding feast. By the way, interesting, in the Hebrew, that word for feast right there where it says feast, literally translated, it means wine banquet. And he's there again at a wine banquet. Remember, he's not supposed to touch wine, but he's down there. Oh, you know, I'm sure they would have said, like we say today, oh, you have to have it at the reception. It is amazing to me that people want to have that stuff at their reception. Do you know that according to divorce lawyers, alcohol plays a role in 60% of all divorces? And yet, right at the inauguration of a marriage, we want to make sure we've got it right there. That is an amazing thing. So he goes down there, and in the middle of the banquet, he says, hey, I've got a riddle for you guys. Now remember, Samson loved riddles. He loved turns of phrases and things like that. He had a way with words. He says, I want to make a bet. If I give you a riddle that you can't answer, you have to give me 30 changes of garments and 30 sheets. But if I give you a riddle and you answer it, I'll have to pay you that same thing. So they said, okay, what's the riddle? Well, now remember, Samson had just killed this lion, and so he's thinking about that. Later on, when he passed that way, there was a swarm of bees that had actually set up shop in the carcass of the lion. And Samson went to that carcass, wasn't supposed to touch anything dead, remember, and he got some honey out of that, and he went and he took it to his parents. Now, the parents didn't even know where it came from, but he took it and he, he gave it to them. The lion thought he was going to have Samson for a steak, but he made a mistake in that because Samson killed him and then those bees were there. And so here's that lion laying there and he gets something sweet out of the carcass of the lion. So here's the riddle. He says, out of the eater, now that's the lion, came forth food, that's the honey. And then he says, out of the strong, that's the lion, came forth something sweet. And again, that's the honey. But he didn't give them the explanation like I just gave to you. He just said, out of the eater came forth food, and out of the strong came forth sweet. Now y'all go figure that out. So they tried to figure it out, and they couldn't figure it out. And they know they're in serious trouble, so they go to Samson's new wife, the Philistine, their relative, and they say, you better tell us what he's doing or we're going to get you. So she goes to Samson and she says, sweetheart, can you tell me the answer to the riddle? At this point, gentlemen, let me give you a pro tip regarding marriage. Samson makes a super big mistake. You know what he says to her? He says, I haven't even told my mom and dad. Why would I tell you? Oh, man, don't do that. Okay? So... So she begins to cry, okay? She turns on the waterworks. Now here's a man who can stand up against a lion that attacks him. But his wife's tears, 
He says, okay, I'll tell you. So the Bible says he told her all that was in his heart, and she immediately ran and told that to her brothers, told them everything. They go to Samson and say, we know the riddle. And when they told him, Samson, again, gentlemen, pro tip number two when it comes to marriage. Here's what Samson says. If you, this is the quote. If you hadn't plowed with my young cow, you wouldn't have found the answer. Now, right there, he called his wife a heifer. Okay, don't do that, guys. What he was saying is, you broke the rules. Now, if you, if you know anything about plowing back then or even today in a lot of third world countries, you don't plow with female cows. You plow with oxen. You plow with male cows, okay? So what he's saying is, you broke the rules, but that's not how it came out. So Samson is so infuriated after this that he goes out to get their 30 changes of garments, and he gets them by killing 30 Philistines, taking off their clothes, and going and paying the debt in that fashion. Now, why do I bring all that story up? Because something strange is at work here in Samson's life. And some of this plays into our politics of today as well. Samson was supposed to deliver Israel from the Philistines. But you begin to wonder as you start to look at his life, whose battle is he fighting after all? Is this about God or is this about him? Have you ever seen sometimes in church a so-called man of God and they don't know who they're fighting? They get into little personal battles. And folks, I'll tell you, Baptists are this way a lot. When Baptists aren't fighting the devil, we're fighting each other. That's kind of the way it works. And so you look at this and say, whose battle is he actually fighting? He's no longer fighting the battle of the Lord. This has gotten personal. It is a sad, sad thing. Well, his own brothers say, Samson, you're starting to get us into trouble. You've kind of stirred up a hornet's nest here, and the Philistines are coming down on us a little bit. And so Samson says, okay, I'll take care of that. I'll just go turn myself in. So he goes and he turns himself in. He surrenders to the Philistines. Well, they begin to take him, and they're going to take him back to their capital city. Well, they get to a little narrow place in the mountainside, and the Spirit of God comes on Samson. He reaches down into the field and picks up the jawbone of a dead donkey and he begins to kill Philistines with it. And apparently it's so narrow that they're just coming after him in little individual uh, attack plans there, and he's just killing each one of them as they come. And before it was over, he had slain a thousand people, a thousand armed men with the bone of a dead donkey. Now he had a way with words, and the word for donkey and the word for heap, they sound very much alike in Hebrew. Hamar and Hamor are the two words. So he's just playing with words, and he says, with the jawbone of a donkey have I piled them in a heap. So he's playing and making a joke right in the middle of the battle. He's making a joke. He can't take himself seriously. He doesn't understand the ramifications of what's going on. He dishonored his parents. He deserted his promise, and he is distorting his purpose. He's on the way down. Number four, he defiled his purity. He defiled his purity. Verse 1, chapter 16, Samson went to Gaza where he saw a prostitute and went to bed with her. This once mighty man of God, a man that the angel of the Lord, a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus Christ himself, comes to this planet and says to his parents, you are going to have a baby. That boy is now running around with prostitutes. Her name's Delilah. You know, Satan never tells you up front how this is going to end, by the way. So when you get involved in sin, all you know is the excitement of the lust that's going on in your life for that thing that you want, and you don't ever see the consequences of it up front. So here's Samson now. 
His mother had prayed for him. His dad had separated him to God. He was a Nazarite, and he's sleeping around with a prostitute. You just want to shake him and say, Samson, can't you see? No, he couldn't. Because, folks, as you're going to see later on in the story, they gouge out Samson's eyes. But he was blind a long time before they did that. The deeper people go into sin, the less they even know about it. He's running around with prostitutes. The Philistines set a trap for him. They say, we'll fence him in. So Samson gets to the gates, sees that the gates are locked. He just picks the gates and the poles up and walks out of the city holding the gates. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 3 says, For the lips of a strange woman drop as a honeycomb, and her mouth is smoother than oil. But listen to what Solomon says. But her end is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Her feet go down to death. Her steps take hold on hell, so that you shall not ponder the path of life. Her ways are movable, and you can't know them. This sin is like no other sin. He's crossed a line. And here is a man of God who defiled his purity. Number five, he diluted his power. He diluted his power. Delilah's there now, and Delilah's family comes to her and says, Delilah, can you find out what makes Samson so strong? And if you do, we're going to give you a bunch of money. We'll pay you. They offered to pay her between three and five thousand dollars to get that secret so she says samson i've got a question for you what is it that makes you so strong where'd you get all that strength she begins to stroke his hair what makes you so strong samson's just playing the game he says you know if you would tie me with seven green vines then i'd be weak just like everybody else so while he's asleep she calls in the Philistines, they get seven green vines, they tie him, and as soon as he wakes up, he just snaps those vines, those vines fall off, and he goes in and he beats up the guys who had tied him. She says, Samson, you lied to me. How can you really be bound? He says, well, if you would bind me with new ropes, then that's what would work. And again, he's asleep, and she binds him with new ropes. By the way, at what point do you think he starts to understand, maybe she doesn't have my best interests at heart? And I say that, and it's a joke, and we do laugh, and I laugh. But that's what sin does to you. It blinds you to this sort of thing. He's asleep, so she binds him with those new ropes. And he gets up, and he breaks them. The Bible says like they'd been burned in a fire, like they were nothing. She says, Samson, you lied to me. And then he gets a little bit closer. He said, well, if you would braid my hair, that's what would do it. He's getting closer. That doesn't work either. So finally she says, Samson, I'm sick of this. Tell me. And she starts to cry. Samson says, well, if you were to cut off my hair, I'd be weak just like anybody else. And folks, his hair at this point was the only thing he had left in that Nazarite vow. That vow that says I'm separated to God, the only thing left was the hair. Verse 19, then she let him fall asleep on her lap and called a man to shave off the seven braids on his head. In this way, she made him helpless and his strength left him. Then she cried, Samson, the Philistines are here. And when he awoke from his sleep, he said, I will escape as I did before and shake myself free. And one of the saddest words in the Bible, but he did not know that the Lord had left him. He didn't know that his strength was gone. He didn't even know it. By the way, it had been so long since he had been so in touch with God that he didn't even remember what it was like. He didn't know it was gone. Folks, that challenges me. That ought to challenge you. That ought to challenge you if you're a deacon or a Sunday school teacher or if you work with children or if you work with students. That ought to be a challenge to us that we never get to the point where the Spirit of God leaves effectiveness in our lives and we don't even know he's gone. How many people begin in the Spirit and then end up in the flesh? He diluted his power. Number six, he disgraced his profession. 
He disgraced his profession. Look at verse 21. The Philistines seized him, gouged out his eyes. They brought him down to Gaza and bound him with bronze shackles, and he was forced to grind grain in the prison. But his hair began to grow back after it had been shaved. The Philistine leaders gathered together to offer a great sacrifice to their god Dagon. They rejoiced and said, Our God has handed over our enemy Samson to us. When the people saw him, they praised their God and said, Our God has handed over to us our enemy who destroyed our land and who multiplied our dead. Samson has now become an opportunity for people to praise an idol God. He has now become an opportunity for the world to look and say, see, I knew their God wasn't anything. I knew their God couldn't do that. What about you? Do people look at your life and do they say, I knew that wasn't really anything. I knew that was just something that you do on Sundays. I knew that wasn't really anything that dealt with day-to-day -day life. He's in a depth at this point of sin and depravity, and they take that poker, shh, stick it into his eye. I bet he screams. Then they put it in the other eye. Sunshine will now never see the sunshine. His eyes are gone. He's blind. And they take him and they make him grind grain, which is what animals did. And in that place, he has disgraced his profession. And they say, where is God? I thought this was the mighty man. I wish we had more time to talk on that, but we need to get to number seven. He diminished his potential. He diminished his potential. Samson said, God, I've been such a fool. Verse 28, he called out to the Lord, Lord God, please remember me. Strengthen me, God, just, one, just once more. With one act of vengeance, let me pay back the Philistines for my two eyes. Samson took hold of the two middle pillars supporting the temple and leaned against them, one on his right hand, the other on his left. And Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. He pushed with all his might and the temple fell on the leaders and all the people in it. And the dead that he killed at his death were more than those he killed in his life. The Bible says his hair began to grow. Literally translated, that says his head began to grow. I think Samson began to think a little bit and come to his senses and say, God, I've been a fool. God, give me one more chance. I don't care how long you've gone, folks. I don't care what you may have done. God is a God of mercy. God is a God of forgiveness. God is a God of a second chance. Do not let anybody ever tell you you've gone too far. There is a balance in a message like this when you preach it. There is a balance between telling people God is a God of love and a God of forgiveness who longs for you to come home, but at the same time not saying that how you live today doesn't matter. You see what the story is telling us? It's telling us both of those things. It matters how you live, but God is a God of forgiveness and a God of grace. So he finds a little boy and he says, can you take me up there to the temple and let me just stand in between those pillars? And they're there and they're laughing at him. And he says, God, give me strength. And then they begin to hear that rumbling noise. And then there's all that cascading marble and then there is silence. After all the pandemonium, Samson is dead and all the Philistines are dead. And the Philistines died, but he died. And he died young, and he died needlessly. He died pathetically. He is in heaven, but I think of what he could have been. I think of what he should have been. He diminished his potential. Two things I want to make sure are in your heart today. Number one, the high cost of sin. Sin cost him the respect and relationship he had with his parents. It cost him the respect and relationship of his extended family. It cost him all kinds of problems with the nation of Israel. It cost him his eyesight. It cost him all sorts of problems. Don't play lightly with sin. Have no mercy on sin in your life because sin will have no mercy on you. Don't you have mercy on your sin? Sin starts small and then it gets big. But I'm going to say something else. 
it is not impossible no matter who you are no matter where you are no matter what is going on in your life right now there is help and there is hope in a God who extends a hand of mercy to you and that hand of mercy begins right now I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes